for dinner. Nice uh, basil pesto, good amount of garlic in there. So uh, be glad that this is uh, not smell vision That's all I'm saying. Uh, what a start to a podcast. It's International Podcasting Day, I, I, I think. Possibly. <laughs> um, how's the sound quality? Uh, here we go. Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes. Marvellous. Uh, so David Shepard has pointed out that we have 36 seconds per way for railway rails to fail um, on average for an hour to get through all of these for episode 29. Will we manage it? That is that is a very good question. Will we manage it? Um, how are you all? Are you all well? It's nice to see you all popping up. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. I think you know what. I'm gonna try. This this is this is exciting, because I've got a slightly new tech setup. Uh, so let's see if the intro works, shall we? Uh, everyone can see it's all doing the right thing. Yeah. Welcome to tonight's Rail Matter. Two two five, fading away, fading away, and leaving us with this vision of the modern railway. Did the uh, did the, did that? Did everyone hear the sound there? Did that work fine? Yes, this is a shoebox. Uh, isn't it beautiful? The West Midlands have announced the worst station design ever, and here it is. Um, look at this, absolutely stunning. Oh no, sorry, that that's uh, that's a picture of a shoebox. Uh, here's the station. Uh, wait, I can see no difference. Actually, the shoebox is better because it has eaves. Look at that. Anyway, frightening. Um, dear Christ, this is this is just one of the worst things I've ever seen. And actually, what's what's worse? The, the thing that's worst about this isn't actually the station box because that's dismal. So let's get the let's let's get this out right. So this station box here, there it is. This horrible thing uh, is a part. It's it's two parts so actually there's a there's sort of a let me just get my, my 3d so there's a bit there's actually a gap uh that runs in through here uh ish something like that and the, and underneath are is it's basically a footbridge and underneath the tracks are kind of going through here like this and so that's why it, that's kind of so there's more to it so an aerial shot it doesn't look quite as bad but from this shot which is basically the shot that everyone will have you will have uh this absolutely dismal visage the worst thing about this um by a by a, a long shot frankly um are the railings these railings these pedestrian railings if ever a, a development has a barrier like this against a pavement it's a failure of urban design just off the, straight off the bat a failure of urban design and these are the things that make me most angry um yeah, absolutely dismal. I, I think I popped up in the eye paper today, quoted about how much I hate this thing. It's just awful. Absolutely awful. Michael, it's all right. You, you, you're, you, no one minds that you're too late. Um, right, so, yeah. Uh, no, you're not supposed to see So it's a slight change to the format. I'm going to avoid my face through the news uh, simply so that uh, the tech works, but also so I stay focused. And also because my face keeps covering the, the Chiron, which is quite long. Anyway, right, yes. Uh, Owen... O'Neill points out that the the more he looks at it, it seems like a reclad of the existing building instead of a new build. So another thing that I, I hate about this is that they appear to have completely blitzed all of the... So let, let's have a look at what it... This is what it looks like currently. Here is the station here. This is the station building, this this bit here. And when I'm talking about pedestrian railings, these are what I'm talking about. They're, they're bad. The, these are bad. They should, shouldn't exist anywhere. It's a sign of a complete failure. However, this is... Okay, it, it maybe looks a little bit... A little bit... Um, rough well it doesn't even look that rough this is a nice set this is actually quite a nice this has the potential to be quite a nice street street environment it is a uh, nice mixed use uh i think this is quite cool personally i think it's quite retro chic inside is dismal don't get me wrong but they could i think that's got character for me that's quite a unique i've never seen a station frontage like that i think it's quite unique i quite like it i think they should stay okay gut the inside improve it but what on earth is the car parking space for and 
why can't they keep the mixed use development? This is this is good stuff. People work here. You know, it gives a bit of a vibe. It makes it part of the community. This is this is good. What what this is is sterile and horrible. This is it's like the definition of the worst of gentrification. I just everything about it from top to bottom is hateful. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether that's sort of the plan. The thing is, I don't know if it is because on this side, so over the edge here, is quite high up. So I don't know if it is going to be for for development going on on top. It's just hateful, absolutely hateful. Anyway, that's that's that news. In other news, uh, the latest transport usage stats are out, and it is not good as you'd expect because since when was it about about mid September we've had the the kind of announced uh, sort of uh, lockdown mark two. So basically locked down by stealth. And you can see that even ro road usage is starting to tip uh, downwards again a little bit. Uh, bus usage, which has been pretty much steady the whole time since since the kind of the end of, of, of kind of formal lockdown. Even that's starting to tip over. You can sort of see the trend. Uh, and rail, which has had a pretty dicky sort of couple of months, to be honest, much though it is very much kind of trending downwards as well. So... Um, not not really good not good uh not good at all cycling is sort of bouncing around a bit um this there's always an up spike in my graphs uh it's because i'm doing a running average which a, a weekly running average which a uh, moving average which sort of you, you get that don't worry about it anyway uh latest transport usage stats that's those i'll they'll, they'll be tweeted soon ah the techies are pretending hyperloop is real again hooray so um yes this is yet another snazzy looking 3D uh, model that someone's made that bears no reality. It's a pod, which means it's junk. Uh, this is a gadget van. It's nonsense. It's rubbish. Uh, the most important thing about Hyperloop is, uh, well, basically, the reason I've, the reason I've uh, kind of ranting about this again is because um, uh, there was another piece, a fawning piece in the FT or one of the FT spin-off sort of uh, publications going on about all the people who are working on Hyperloop stuff in Europe. All of them are charlatans, of course. Uh, yeah, it's just dismal. The reason it's dismal, uh, you can find the thread where I go into the details, but basically, this is the relentless problem, right? This this is the key issue that's, that's just the mistake that's always made, which is that there are a load of people who argue, shout, uh, say that the abilities of Hyperloop, the technology, whatever it is, they get hung up on the technology and say, oh, it, it will work. Look, the technology will work. At the same time, you have a bunch of economists who are going uh, or who are being uh, kind of uh, frog marched into saying, uh, oh, look, there's this d desperate market demand for, for people who want to want to travel if, if there was, you know, if you sped things up. And all the while, this, this this conversation kind of goes round and round and round and round. All the while, no one's actually talking about the most important thing, which is um, system capacity. It's the fact that Hyperloop, no matter whether it works or not, is rubbish it will carry very very few people therefore it's it's just rubbish it's just a complete waste of everyone's time it's a waste of human effort um the system capacity of of hyperloop is like around about three to four thousand there we go at some point i'll get a whack him uh passengers per hour per direction which is you know if you compare that to to sort of thames link which is forty thousand uh or you know other other metro systems where you're looking at like a hundred thousand uh yeah doesn't compare waste of time uh it, uh, you know, hs2 is around twenty thousand by the way anyway uh enough of my dreadful sketches uh right what else is in the news oh hydrogen trains continue to exist hooray so today the uh the hydroflex is out running at line uh, at speed which is which is quite cool I was in this last year at Rail Live, and it moved at about five miles an hour, uh, and wasn't hugely impressive. But it was moving, you know. So, and it was within, you know, UK loading gauge. So that's that's all great. Here's Grant Chaps looking um, decidedly squashed. Anyway, the weight of the world on his shoulders. Uh, yeah, I'm already, or it's a very heavy high vis. It's hard to tell. In any case, um, yes, this this is exciting. Ish hydrogen does have a part to play. You know, about ten percent of the unelectrified single track kilometers in the in the UK require hydrogen um as the mode of traction so that's rural rural lines with um uh, kind of low speed infrequent services and no regular freight so that's like the far north line the west highland line the welsh uh, the heart of wales line the Aberystwyth, you know the the, the cambrian line uh, and some of the east anglian sort of fringe lines as well those those are all sort of suited to hydrogen ironically not the t's t's sort of the t side or t's coast um 
Time Tees Coast sort of hydrogen uh, proposals, which seem to have hit the news a lot, despite them actually that area is very much suited to full electrification because it's pretty frequent. Services along there and freight and all sorts. Anyway, they continue to exist. They've been around and carrying passengers for ages. Uh, yeah, oh well, yeah, that's right. I did have the stats. There we are. So a reminder of the episode, the TDNS episode for a few episodes of Rail Matter ago, where we um, where we went into this stuff and explained where hydrogen is, is useful or is not useful. Uh, oh yeah, and if you want to learn more about hydrogen trains, go back to Good Grief. How many episodes ago? Lots of episodes ago. Back to episode four, when we uh, had our first guest, Mike, joined us. Uh, and everything was looking a bit a bit ropey, and I think I possibly didn't update the the intro video quite as I should. Uh, it was it was pretty ropey. You watch it back and see how how much more professional things are now. <laughs> anyway, uh, ah yes, this is a good news story in that it's a, a dreadful news story. People are very stupid. This is an important piece of news. This photo went up, uh, shared by a, a driver actually, a rail you know, a train driver who was who was driving back from getting shopping i think uh and uh, spotted this situation which is a, a completely frighteningly incompetent contractor um and not necessarily the people with the boots on the ground i'll, I'll add this is the, someone in an office has signed off on this traffic management system and hasn't given them adequate warning not to do what they've just done here which is put uh basically put a traffic light on the apron of a level crossing in such a way that traffic can get caught on the level crossing and get smashed to bits by a train uh, and potentially kill some people, which is not a good idea. So yes, people are very, very stupid. Uh, this got uh, dealt with pretty quickly. Um, I'm happy to say I phoned this number uh, to deal with it, but actually the driver who was there, so, so two things. Firstly, if you're at a level crossing in person and you spot something dodgy, there's always a telephone. Find the telephone, ring that, it goes straight to the signaler and they will set everything to caution or they'll stop trains depending on the severity of the thing you're reporting. But don't hesitate to do that, just do it. Um, if you're not there and you're seeing a picture on social media like I did, this is the number you want to phone. 0345 711 4141 and then press 1. Um, so that's for emergencies. That's the Network Rail Rapid Response number. They will, they're, they're very, very knowledgeable, friendly, um, but also keen to sort, you know, they're, they're very safety conscious and they will push. Basically, they're very patient, but they know how to get the right answers quickly. So they're, they're really good people to phone. So if you've got an issue, if you've spotted something, if you're on a platform and you've spotted something on the um, on the track that looks a bit dodgy and you can't see any station staff around or it's, you know, it's an unattended station or you're walking along a railway line on a footpath and you spot something that doesn't look right happening on the track, this is the number to phone. Dial it and they will send a, a mom, a mobile operations manager out to, to spot the problem and fix it and if they can't get someone out quickly they'll put they can they can speak to signalers and 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 set things to caution so this is the number to phone very very good number to record put it in your phone so you can quick them, uh, phone them quickly anyway people are very stupid ah right okay that's that's the end of the news uh, oh am i allowed to say where that was uh that's wait a minute jonathan dixon is asking this is um was it black bank in uh in in cambridgeshire i think uh yes this this got um th that's where this happened so pretty shoddy daniel are you on the line is 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 mr pike here is he is he, is he on I, I see a dan i did see a dan p in the chat where is he is he here in any case uh what about the dacia sander no matt no i may look like james may but i am not james may let's do let's do this I mean, firstly let's say hello hello i've got i've got my um my Hydroflex badge because I got given this by Alex Burrows. If you're watching, uh, which you probably aren't because you'll be frighteningly busy and hopefully having a pint, but um, if you are watching uh, at any point, see, I said I'd get the branding on. Um, <laughs> yes, congratulations, to University of Birmingham and Porterbrook for their achievement today. It's quite cool, even if even if the, the there's perhaps some slightly exaggerated excitement. Right. Yes, that is more than a hundred rails. This is this is this is. Wait a minute. Yeah, there you are, Dan. You're on there. Um, this is a picture that I nabbed a long time ago. It's a bit weird seeing rails, but people in a different colour of high vis. But anyway, this is a nicely staged picture of Dan in his former employment. Um, let's not talk too much about that. But it's yeah, I'm sad Dan's not still there. But anyway, uh, not lost to the industry, I don't think, which is good. Anyway, moving swiftly on, these are rails, and they're 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 fundamental to railways. Funnily enough, they're incredibly important. They are precision engineered pieces of steel. Oh, you can't see them. That's because I need to press this button. Let's do that. There we are. Hello, I'm small. Have a cup of tea here as well. Cup of tea. 
Uh, Dan, there are two idiots in yellow. Um, anyway, right. So, yes, rails. They're very, very important. Uh, as I say, they're a precision... They're absolutely precision machine piece of equipment. These are not lunking girders like the thing in the background you can see up here. Uh, there we are. This, this thing up here is a girder, and it's made to... Okay, I can't say this because British Steel also probably say they make that to precision, but not not nearly to the precision of railway rails. It's not just about the the shape, but it's also the the content of the steel, the quality of the steel, the consistency of the steel. It's an incredibly important thing because these are part of a a dynamic system. A, a moving the railways are a machine, the trains are moving across them. It's not a static thing. So um anyway yeah, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. So most of the time we'd like to think that we're um lining up our, our rails looking absolutely beautiful there's there's uh, colton junction looking super sexy um i shall continue to oh, i should have explained right audio explain these are two people one with a clipboard which is dan uh with a big pile of steel rails piled up uh, on top of each other well they're not piled up on top of each other they're presumably on a very careful carefully kind of laid out rack thing so they don't actually scratch and dent each other <laughs> they've also all got a circle drawn on them in pen which i don't know why Maybe these are maybe these are failed ones. Dan could tell people in the um, in the chat. Anyway, uh, this is Colton Junction, which I don't need to audio describe because it's it's appeared so many times in rail matters that you should all know it. Anyway, this is what rails look like when they're laid out beautifully, but more often than not, the track uh, underneath rails gets a bit. You know, the, the the permanent way can take a pretty hefty pounding, either from the trains going over the top or indeed from you know ground conditions underneath not being perfect. So. These rails have to work in both situations. They have to work when the railway is perfect. They have to work when things are a little bit dicky, um, because if you get if you get things wrong, and that's that's not just the support, it's not just what they're sat on, but it's also the alignment. You know, the smoothness of the alignment defines how well um, the railway system behaves. If you get that wrong, oh, in fact, let's. Oh, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. So, so what's a, this is basically my day job, by the way, which is converting kind of heavy civil engineering materials like steel, kind of concrete and aggregate. And turning them into a precision engineering system. Um, so I always point out to my students. These are slides from my, stu from my students, by the way. You'll notice um, that uh, railway rails, the, the contact patch between the steel wheel and the steel rail, is about the size of a five pence piece. So that's not very much size of contact between steel, between different steels. And so if you get that wrong, um, this happens. Uh, does anyone in the chat know where this is? Does anyone recognise this this image? I'm gonna have a sip of tea while people. I'll, I'll, I'll already describe it. I'll have the tea or between tea sips. This is a length of rail. You can see here. This is about 35 metres of rail, and it's shattered into over 200 pieces. Um, and so this is an image that was taken from a crash report. And it, basically, they stacked up all the bits of rail they could find, a bit like when the uh, you know air crash assemblers put the train back together, uh, put the air the airplane back together. In this instance, the uh, crash investigators were putting the, uh, the the bits of rail back together to see what had happened. Uh, lots of people correctly saying Hatfield in the chat. Uh, correct, this is Hatfield. Uh, a rail shattered into bits because we hadn't got the well, we hadn't got maintenance right, but also we hadn't got the alignment right. There are problems with the way that we had designed that that track to, that that made that that track alignment that made this situation worse, uh, and thankfully we've learned from that. We've learned, we've mostly improved our processes. Um, we've uh, kicked rail track into touch, uh, which has helped. Yeah, uh, we we're thankfully in a place where that sort of incident shouldn't happen again, but constant vigilance is important. Oh, right, here's, here's a, a picture of a rail because it's important to know what bits are because I'm going to be referring to these quite a lot in this episode that I'm already 20 minutes into without having started on rail failures. Uh, the top bit there, so this is a cross-section of a rail, so I've taken a slice to a rail. The, the kind of the round, lumpy bit on the top is called the head, as you'd imagine, a bit like my head, uh, large and lumpy. Uh, the uh, the bit that's the kind of the sticky-up bit that's between the, between the bottom and the top is called the web, just as it is with steel girders for any of the civil engineer, normal civil engineers out there. Um, and the bottom bit is called the foot. So you've got a head, a foot, and the thing between them is called the web. There is that. That's fairly clear, I hope. Um, right, here we go. Oh, right, yeah, okay. So um, we've got to think not just about cross-sections, but also about how we join rails up. So um, in yon olden days, uh, a single length of rail was uh, 60 foot long. It was a 60-foot length of rail. Nowadays, 18.288 metres. 
The reason for that was because that was about as long a thing uh, you could get that, that could be hauled around by, by a, a bunch of people um, uh, manually. Uh, any longer than that, it was difficult. Uh, and it also allowed you to do certain uh, radii of curve without pre-curving the, 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 the rail as well. So you could 50 pence piece a train around a curve. Um, but nowadays, generally, um, Dan kicks would have, well, British Steel would have kicked out um, 108 or 216 meter lengths, long welded rail sections that are then welded up. Um, so in the past, we uh, would have, you know, you, you pull out your rails. Here we are. So this, this, this bam nut all here, pulling out some rails for the Borders Railway. Uh, you see a nice little machine there, pulling them along onto the nice G44 sleepers. Fast clip. Lovely job. Look at those. Whoa. And a bit of a, an interesting sort of prefabricated concrete platform thing on a curve. On a curve. Bit bit dubious about that on a new rail, is it? Anyway. Also, there's a cheeky GoPro on the front. Clearly getting all the snazzy shots. Anyway, um, two ways to join up rails. One of them is with a, a fish-plated joint here. So this is a bolted fish-plated joint. So two fish plates either side. Uh, and then four bolts traditionally would have connected them. Does anyone spot the problem with this one? Oh yeah, no one can talk to me. This is a this is a silent medium. <laughs> uh, Dan P's pointing out that the longest rails made in the UK are 120 meters. This is indeed bullhead rail. Actually, it's not even 95 pound bullhead rail. This is uh, this is 80 pound rail, I think. So it's quite a light rail section. Um, yeah, the big obvious thing that's gone here is that the fish plate is um, is broken in two. Uh, and there's also a little bit of rail end batter here, which we'll get to later. Which is ironic, because actually I don't have a picture for rail end batter, but here is a picture of rail end batter, so make a mental note of that. So yeah, you can see the problem with fish plated joints is that there's a tremendous force goes um, when the wheel is going from one, uh, as it passes over, you know, in whichever direction it's going, when that wheel passes over the joint, it puts a tremendous bash down, uh, hammering the joint, hammering all the bits and, and uh, the bolts, the plates, and indeed the sleepers either side. Joints are just terrible. Avoid them at all costs. Um... And also, they're bad in hot weather. People often think, oh, jointed track was better for, for hot weather. Long weathered rails, are, you know, they expand. Nope, because these things generally close up uh, in hot weather. And then there is, and then the, the issue you've got then is that the P-way, the, the tracks that make uh, make up you know, all this stuff, this is timber, so it's super light. Uh, it's all very weak, and it generally just falls to bits in hot weather. So uh, jointed is bad. It does the job in some places, like the far north line. The other way you connect up rails is by welding them together. Uh, hopefully not like this, because this is an aluminothermic weld, uh, which is deeply primitive and rubbish, and yet it's the way that we do most rail welds in the UK still on site. But um, yeah, you can see, so you basically heat a load of stuff up and stick the rails together with it. Um, far more preferable when you're doing a weld is, uh, is a flashback weld like this. So the, the worst quality flashback weld will always be better than the best quality aluminothermic weld. Uh, also, aluminothermic welds take like 20 minutes if you're on a if you're at a jog, whereas a flashback weld takes about a minute and a half, and you can do absolutely loads on a, on a shift. Uh, so obviously, Network Rail made all of this, you know, sold all their kit and made all the staff redundant. Um, so a uh, great great effort there, everyone. Good work. Pat ourselves on the back, rail industry. Oh, right. How are we doing? 1924, and we're not even started yet. Look at this. Um, anyway, so by joining up all those rails, you end up with... Uh... Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to audio describe that last image. This is a massive machine on the end of a road rail vehicle arm, and it looks bonkers. It looks like it's got kind of comedy intestines spread all over it. It's all the different cables and uh, hydraulic pipes feeding it and everything. And there's loads of exciting sparks coming out of it. And it's clearly also got a massive hydraulic sort of um, ram thing. And it essentially welds the two rails. It picks the, the rails up welds them together actually looking at it it appears that this also stresses the rails it looks like there are stress tensors down at the bottom so this actually also stresses the rails which is a, another story i'll do a rail natural buckling at some point but um rail stressing is important anyway uh, you end up with a railway system that looks a bit like this lots of rails all connected up looking nice this is a decent bit of alignment you can see they're still doing some construction up the top end there uh good grief the s and t stuff around here that's a lot of cable management uh i think this is the approach to london bridge that's quite a bit of railway anyway um uh yes so um oh people are saying does that pre-stress jonathan dixon yes it does pre-stress good question um oh someone else is saying clapham junction no no no. this is uh i think this is the approach to london bridge station uh it looks like the type to me it looks like that kind of uh that kind of alignment i think actually possibly this is above london bridge station looking southwards 
That's my guess. And then the stuff in the bottom right-hand corner is coming into the terminal platforms. I have to be correct on that, but I reckon that's where this is. It's a snazzy picture. Particularly snazzy are these... Um, no, you can't see that one. Let me get yellow up. Where's my yellow? Uh, here we are. Particularly snazzy are these um, G55 cable management sleepers down here. Whoa, look at that. Lovely. Like those. Um, they're very nice. Anyway, right, moving on. Oh, yeah, the last thing about rails, which is relevant, uh, is this is actually a bit of a weird, slightly uh, unconventional um, bit of rail branding. But we um, we mark up on the web, we, we put uh, we put branding marks on the uh, on the web of the rail that tell us important things. Uh, so when you're going out and looking at a railway that has all this stuff on it, uh, 30 years later, you can see what age the rails are. So most importantly for me, the most important thing when I'm out inspecting track is this. It's the, the year that the rail was uh, created. So if it's, um, the, the magic number is 1976. If it's pre-76 rail, uh, I, I normally let out a little whelp uh, and then say, right, replace desperately because it'll be full of horrible uh, defects and flaws because um, up until that point, it was ingot cast rather than continuous cast, as Dan will be able to describe in the chat. Anyway, other things. So BS means British Steel. Uh, sorry, that means the standard. That's the standard chosen. Uh, so it's BS 113A. So 113A here is the equivalent to the modern 56E1. So that's the that's the weight and section of the rail. Um, uh, there's this this bit. What was the zero? I think this is related to the um, to the actual grade of the steel. But I think this is a slightly archaic way of putting it. This is then British Steel. Uh, British Steel Company in, in their Workington uh, plant. So uh, that age is that as well. Um, and then this is the customer. I think it's for BR, I believe. This is a slightly unconventional set of branding. This isn't quite the order that the, that the new stuff is. And I'm happy to say that uh, new rail branding is like pretty much every three or four meters now on rails, which is helpful because in the olden days, like this age, it was like hundreds of meters apart. And also it wears down to be completely invisible by the time it's got all the muck and filth and bog roll stuck to it. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, these are a nightmare to spot in. The, like, basically, you have to hold a torch kind of against the web to spot any of this stuff. There we are. We're half an hour in and haven't even started. So, uh, great success so far. Very, very pleased with the show. Uh, here we go. Uh, Dan is not going to get into explaining Comcast in the chat, apparently. Well, Dan, why on earth are you, what, what, what have you joined for, if, if not to explain continuous casting to the, to the, the punters? Um, <laughs> Uh, is it a different style of rail for third elect for the third electrified rail, or is it just the same as a normal rail but just electric? Oh, Dan will answer that in the chat. But no, it is a different rail. It's a different rail section. It's squatter, and I think it probably has a slightly different uh, uh, kind of alloy makeup as well. Uh, I'm sure Dan will cover that. Right. Anyway, let's get started. We're going to refer. So I'm going to be referring to this thing here. Um, I'm still I'm still in the top corner, aren't I? Yeah. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, hello. Um, I'm going to be referring to this standard because this is the current best practice standard in terms of capturing all the rail failures in the UK and it's based oh wait a minute let me get let me get let me get the big picture up it's based on this thing here this is the uh, original is it the original actually it's not this is the third edition from 1968 this is the british rail rail failures handbook uh, and it's pretty much the same in terms of the stuff in it in fact to the point where you'll recognize a lot of the pictures in it uh, particularly uh, should we get the famous one out my favorites uh, so the the, the 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 issues the the pictures have not necessarily changed that much, but uh, some of the where is it? Oh, I can't can I find it, Captain. Uh, where are we? Oh, there we go. That's that's some of my faves. There we are. Some nice pictures there. You'll recognise those. Um, they're still in there. They've just done a really bad job of scanning them. The scan quality is dismal. But this this is a really nice handbook. It's a nice robust one. It was designed to be taken out onto site. Um, I'm very pleased to have that. Thanks. Um, Thanks very much, Peter Ellis. That's very happy with that. Anyway, it's quite cool to have that. Uh, but this standard I'm using is basically der derived from that. That's from 1968. I wonder when the original's from. I can't remember, actually. Third edition. Weirdly, it's third edition 1968 on the front, but it's 1969 on the inside cover. So uh, make of that what you will. Anyway. Brilliant. Right, so. <laughs> oh, is everyone still with me? Uh, right. Here we go. Lowest numbered British standards still in use. Uh, BS9 and BS11 are the are the rail defining standards, I think. Dan will have that in his head. Uh, yes, uh, I think they are some of the oldest British. I mean, the railways forced standardization. The earliest railway standards are, are, are generally related to railways. Sorry, the earliest British standards are related to railways. Anyway, right. 
I digress. Let's get the screen back. So this standard is what we what I'm going to be referring to. Uh, so it'll be a mixture of uh, I'll be double checking myself off the standard to make sure I don't confuse myself and say things that are in, uh, incorrect. But also this will be based on my own experience and, and knowledge. You'd be reassured to know because I do have a little bit of that when it comes to permanent way. Um, yeah. Anyway, right. Okay. Let's actually crack on. Oh no, because we're going to explain things. So these codes are all um, UIC codes that we're going to refer to throughout. So. There's going to be codes associated with each of these rail failures. So the first digit is related to the longitudinal position of failure on the rail, so whether it's at the end or in the middle of the rail. The second is to do with the transverse position on the, of failure on the rail, so whether it's in the head or the web or the foot. Um, and uh, the last two are really about uh, what kind of, you know, they're just numbering for the different failures. And then there's, we're going to have a description of the failure type. Um, oh, and so these are the digits that refer to, so, so these, where's my mouse? Uh, there we go. So this refers to this stuff here, and this stuff refers to this this one here, uh, second digit there, and then these the, these two refer to the, these kind of uh, these ones here. Uh, they're just they're, they're just numbering. So these are the different. If, if you want to pause the video and learn some stuff, if if I end up using this as a learning resource in the future, lol, uh, then um, there's your numbers and your data and understanding where the failure is. But the reason I put the code in is because. Uh, kind of interesting to have codes codes are fun right so let's start right let's start press the timing button so uh rail failure 106 is uh crushing at the rail end uh yeah it's uh generally just due to due to uh, high traffic loads and the rail not being able to cope anymore um generally you'll see this sort of extrusion coming out of the side uh from a crush uh, from being crushed at the end uh so yeah that's not good and also particularly things like uh, places where you've got um uh, insulated uh, rail joints for part of the signalling, that, that metal getting squished out can often bridge the gap between the, the kind of insulating plate, which means that you can have track circuit failures, which is bad. Uh, so there we are, 106, crushing at the rail end. Uh, the next the next one is number 111, uh, progressive transverse cracking or a tash oval at the rail end. Oh, and sadly, there is no picture for this one. So send your pictures to Network Rail and say, use this picture. If you have a picture of a progressive transverse cracking failure at the end of the rail. Um, this is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get, I'll talk a bit more about this when we get to Tasho Val's, uh, when we get to Defect 211. So I'll, I'll get into a bit more detail of that. So we need to, we need to fly through these at a pace. Uh, number 112, horizontal cracking of uh, the head at the rail end. So you can see pretty nasty looking stuff going on here. Um, this uh, this sort of thing is generally as a result of a manufacturing defect, actually. Um, so you can see this kind of gradual separation of upper and, and, and lower section. It's uh, Often it'll start with a, a hydrogen bubble defect or, or some manufacturing defect that then grows. Uh, and for whatever reason, the, the defect manifest, uh, manifests itself as a horizontal rather than a vertical crack, which we'll get to later. Uh, and you just basically get the end of the rail, just crumbles off like this. Um, often it's combined with other sort of failure modes. Uh, yeah, uh, not good. You don't you don't want to see this sort of thing. But generally, these are associated with older rails. Pretty much all, in fact, pretty much. I'd say all of the manufacturer based manufacturer based defects are are essentially you, you you're very 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 unlikely to see them out on the railway uh, nowadays. So anything kind of any of the rail and anything post seventy six is pretty good. But I'm sure Dan would say anything the last twenty years is um, is exceptionally good. You're just not going to see this sort of failure anymore. Um, right, next. So we are going for uh, the same sort of thing. Yeah, longitudinal vertical cracking of the, he uh, the head of the rail. So it's the same sort of thing, usually a manufacturing defect. Um, often it's from some sort of silicon or, or hydrogen bubble inclusion, I believe, are the most common types of, uh, of inclusion. Um, something like that, uh, that that gets involved, and you can see it just manifests itself as a horizontal rather than a vertical, as a longitudinal uh, vertical rather than a horizontal crack. So you can see it's just decided to go with a different plane uh, of failure there. Uh, not good, but uh, yeah, once it's reached the surface, obviously you're knackered. Uh, you, you, you're too late. These things generally would get picked up by ultrasound uh, scans as well. So. Yes, right, here we go. So we're into the first of the various rolling contact fatigue failures. So this one is um, shelling at the rail end. This is a traffic-related defect. So um, you can see, you generally, you'd see a small crack in the outer face. You see these small cracks here. 
uh, these ones here. Let's just make sure I'm drawing. I'm, I'm laser pointing, but actually I need to be drawing because I don't think you can see my laser pointer. Um, and yeah, so, so you'll see maybe a slight crushing as well. You can see this slight crushing and lipping going on here. Uh, this sort of shelling it's, it's not good uh not 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 good at all you, you want to avoid this but it's, it's traffic related generally um and this is something that you'd hope would be picked up by ultrasound let's keep going so um oh 122 gauge corner cracking or head checking at the end of the rail we don't have any pictures of this in the standard so uh yeah if you've got one send it through to nr for them to include in the next issue of the standard um we'll get to this we'll talk a bit more about gauge corner in fact we'll talk quite a bit about gauge corner cracking when we get to the mid section uh the mid rail section uh version of this failure oh who's keeping track i'm going to pause when we get to the end of the of the number ones when we get to the end of the rail end failures we'll pause and have a look through the chat to see what's happening um squat at the rail end again uh we'll talk about squats shortly but um yeah this is another rolling contact fatigue failure uh failure type 127 uh, but this is the rail end so again send your photos through to nr another one wheel burn at the rail end send your photos to nr that's failure 129 uh i feel like i'm reading out the uh i feel like i'm doing the, the pop the, the pop charts countdown just before dave pierce and dance anthems dave pierce dance anthems uh yeah that's like and in it number one three two one horizontal cracking at the web head fillet radius at rail end uh yeah so here you can see um basically you've got a crack that's been following the fillet the fillet being the little curved shape that's been rolled into the uh, cross-sectional profile of the rail. Um, and that, that there's been a crack that's propagated from that web head fillet radius. And then it obviously it's just completely disintegrated the rail at that point. And, and it's also tied, this, this one down here is tied in with a, a star crack, a, a bolt hole. So uh, generally not very good at all. Um, here we go. Here we go. So in at one three two two horizontal cracking at the web foot fillet radius of the rail end. So it's exactly the same thing, but it's at uh, it's at, down at the bottom end. Uh, so it's at the bottom. It's at the it's at the fillet radius at the bottom, connecting the web to the foot rather than the web to the head. The reason that these things can happen, I mean, not not in generally not in modern rail, Dan. I'd expect I'd be very unhappy to see this sort of thing appearing, right? Um, with modern rail but anyway because you have stress concentrations where there's there it the changes to shape so you have a stress concentration at the at the um at these fillets at these curves so that's why you kind of there's a balance to be had of, of minimizing material and weight but also having a suitably smooth fillet to to avoid stress concentrations um dan correct me on these things uh right where are we number one three three uh longitudinal vertical cracking or piping at the rail end yeah this is bad Vertical longitudinal cracking is is uh, or VLS it's often called ver longitudinal vertical splitting uh, sorry vertical longitudinal splitting VLS um, is bad because it's quite difficult to spot um, particularly when it's in the web it's quite challenging to spot and 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 we'll get to the one in the railhead uh, later on but basically if you if if there's this sort of split your your rail it's a difficult spot and your rail will just turn to cheese underneath a freight train a bit like has happened fairly recently I think. Um, Oh, which was I can't remember the name of the derailment now, but there was a freight rail derail, a freight train derailment uh, as a result of a, of a rail turning to cheese uh, with VLS within it. Again, this shouldn't be an issue on modern rails, but it's uh, generally as a result of a of a defect going on. So uh, let's go to one thirty three. Um, yeah, generally you'd you'd there'd be some defect that would kick this off, um, uh, and you can sometimes spot it by you can see it here actually. There's a bit of a bulge in the web. Is so this sort of bulge going on here? Uh, that's one telltale to spot it. If you can see a slightly weird uh, bowing of the w rail web, that's a good. There's a good chance there's some um, VLS in there. Oh, right. Uh, Kentish Railways asks: Was thirteen twenty one what happened at Hither Green in nineteen sixty seven? No, uh, not specifically. We'll get to the that that star cracking at a fishbowl hole. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so this is 133. 135, star cracking of fishbolt holes. Hooray, as if I knew it was next. This is what caused the derailment in 67 at Hither Green that killed a lot of people um, and resulted in a major change to lots of things, really. Uh, it was the initiation of Britain rolling out its use of welded rails, for starters. That was probably the major change, is that it, it really started the demise of jointed track, certainly in, in mainline and metro use. Uh, you can see here what happens. I was just talking about stress concentrations. Well, that's exactly what happens at the... At these holes here, as they're getting fatigued and bashed by by the um, by the bolt within it, as a, as the trains go over, uh, cracks develop. Essentially, you get this classic star pattern, uh, kind of diagonal uh, saltire cracks. Um, and I should have put the hither green 
pictures up actually because I can recognize those in low light uh, and if they're flipped in reverse because they I'm so used to looking at them um yes so star cracking of fish bolt holes is exactly what caused uh, hither green uh, kentish railways so uh there we go that's not about kentish railways by the way that's just kentish railways youtube uh, handle just to avoid confusing the people on the podcast 141 right okay so now we're looking at a battered rail end i've added this picture because uh there isn't one uh on the system but there was a picture i, I showed one earlier in my fish fish plate picture at the start you can see that just at the joint there's a, there's a sufficient um sufficient strike force being put down through a hammer hammer blow as the wheel passes the joint that you're actually getting this this kind of bruising effect uh, on the top of the rail this this battering at the rail end uh, which is bad news and, and the kind of the rail can sort of start to fall to bits at that point um yes yeah, generally maintenance conditions things like dip joints can can contribute to that sort of thing um or or having too much of a gap as well right uh failure 202 short pitch corrugation this is an interesting one so um i'm going to leave this picture up and go through the chat actually right how are we doing uh pretty much everything's so, yeah so dan p is pointing out that uh, split webs uh, basically a lot of these defects are old rail problems particularly pre-76 but but um in fact pretty much uniquely pre-76 rail actually um yes so so most of these you wouldn't expect to see but we have a lot of old rails still on the network um so we have to understand these failure modes just having a sip of tea, everyone. Don't mind me. Wait, what? Dan points out that London Underground doesn't use cold bolt, bolt expansion. Okay, so when you've got these, these star, this star cracking was uh, partially solved. I mean, it was mostly solved by just getting rid of these these joints in the first place. But it was uh, partially solved by, um, weirdly, the research that ended up sort of half solving this problem was was as a result of the comet uh, air disasters. And research into into um, fatigue uh, failure modes um, and stress buildups, and that research went over to America, where they did a load of work with it, and came up with this um, what's called uh, cold bolt, ex bolt expansion, where you shove in a piece of metal with it with a thing called a mandrel on it, which then expands the the hole a little bit, and that results in a compressive force right the way around the circumference of the hole. So any cracks that do form, rather than being opened up by the movement of the joint. They're actually closed by this um, by this uh, additional stress put into the hole by the by the expansion, so that helps avoid the cracks uh, growing and it, it largely solve the problem where where it's applied. The fact that LU don't do it is very confusing to me. Uh, very very strange. Um, yeah, agreed. Very very confusing. Anyway, right. So uh, where were we? Short pitch corrugation. We we're going to have a look at the chat though first, weren't we? So the chat. What's going on? Just lots of people talking about worn out rails. <laughs> um, manganese sulfides usually. I presume that's in reference to the sorts of um, non-metallic uh, non or partially metallic uh, kind of defects. Uh, Non-ferrous defects is what I mean, actually. Non-steel defects. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Oh, looking for piping. Yeah, John Christoph pointing out a, a 70s documentary where Union Pacific's rail production facility uh, involved lots of inspectors inspecting uh, rail ends with calipers to inspect for piping that that it's an interesting approach nowadays we have lots of ultrasonic scans and laser scans and um, the profile has to be accurate to a certain number of microns it's it's spectacular the level of um, quality assurance that these rails have or certainly had uh, i'm sure they'll continue to be as good under the new owners uh, i'm sure i hope uh yes right short pitch corrugation yeah let's talk about short pitch corrugation so Actually, there there are lots of discussions about how this um, how this actually comes to appear, because it's a very strange pattern of, of worn and unworn. Uh, it, it's it's almost like um, well, okay, I'll I'll draw a little diagram for what I have been led to believe the come on uh, led to believe the the, the issue is that co the, or the mechanism for causing this. So as the wheel, so here's my nice straight uh, rail head, and as the wheel as the wheel is kind of coming along it's moving in this direction you get ever so slight and i haven't had this verified but you get ever so slight Rayleigh waves forming in the head of the rail obviously you know with this sort of a, a wavelength and then these Rayleigh waves the wheel goes over and actually ends up wearing um wearing the kind of the peaks in these Rayleigh waves and that's how you end up getting 
these sort of worn unworn patches anyone willing to verify that i believe that's the that's sort of the um that's the behavior mode dan p is saying it's a mixture of plastic flow and wear yeah so the top of the railhead even though this is incredible steel um yeah, this is happening just, just actually, really, it's happening uh, kind of just under the, just ahead of the rail as it's kind of traveling along. It's not like there's this huge ripple and each one gets worn. It's really that just there's a, a kind of maybe one ripple ahead of the. Anyway, basically, that's the mechanism for forming these strange sort of ripples in the top of the rail. Um, uh, yeah, so you get these bright, bright and dark patches, um, generally up to, up to a hundred millimeters, uh, sort of uh, peak to peak, you know, sort of the wavelength. Um, yeah, and drivers generally notice them because it makes a loud, horrible noise. Um, is this picture from Belgium, is the question that I've just been asked. Given that these are monoblocks, uh, sorry, twin block sleepers with a very bizarre thing here, it might well be, yeah. I, I don't know, actually. Uh, it could be. Network Rail have nabbed the picture. I don't know why they haven't used a picture of their own, to be honest, because it's... Anyway. Uh, also, I'm unnerved by this light-coloured ballast here. That tells me there are other serious issues going on at this, this stretch of track. Uh, yeah, not good. That means all the ballast is bouncing around whenever a train goes over and getting covered in dust. Just all around, not not a great situation. Anyway, maintenance. That's generally a, a traffic load and maintenance issue. So here, here's a, an even weirder looking um, uh, sort of defect, which is longer pitch corrugation, where you've got these kind of longer, um, kind of these longer wavelengths, this sort of wavelengths going in the railhead. Dan, any ideas about this? Um, yeah, it's it's to do with to do with lots of it's to do with the fact that the head of the rail this steel actually flows plastically. Um, what we mean by plastic flow is that it's a flow, it's a deformation that's permanent rather than elastic. So um, uh, I can so wait a minute, let's do a, a demonstration of elastic versus plastic for anyone, any non-engineers here. Let's get big face up. Here's a pencil. Uh, this pencil is made of plastic. That's confusing because here's wood. This is wood. That way you won't get confused between talking about plastic with plastic. This is a, a mini milk stick because I am an eight-year-old child. Um, now I'm going to bend this and you can see that I'm bending it. You can see I'm bending it. I'm bending it such, but when I let go, it springs back into place. That's elastic deformation. Springs back into place. Happy days. Now if I start bending this and... Wait a minute. Okay, well, that sort of vaguely, uh, I was hoping it would sort of be a bit more fibrous and not snap quite as dramatically, but you heard the noise. Um, that's plastic deformation, as in deformation where uh, <laughs> the, the, it's, it's permanent. The, the, the shape of deformation is permanent. Okay, actually, it's, it's more than plastic. If it's steel did that, you'd say it was well beyond its plastic limit. But uh, if you can imagine that uh, if I did it with, well, let's have a look here. If I did it with my pencil and bent it such that, I'm trying to see if I've got anything particularly bendy around a paper clip would be good but i don't have anyone any paper clips to access basically if you bend it such that it stays sort of a bit permanently deformed that's plastic anyway does that make sense uh yeah that was a that was a, a very much a brittle failure john christoph yeah that was also i don't get to use this stick as, as in, in gardening as well it's a calamity i tell you a calamity um oh actually here's a can of brew dog if i um if i push this here you can see it's deforming uh, elastically it's springing back to place happy days if i do this that is now plastically deformed it's not returned to its original shape there we go perfect beer cans that they, they solve everything right anyway long pitch corrugation what was i talking about um this is basically these don't have dark and light patches because the wavelength is sufficiently long that the wheel sort of rides through the through the through them um, but it's still noticeable you know it's up to about 300 millimeters of wavelength uh, between the peaks um Again, not good because you, you're ending up with lots of force, extra forces going down to the track. Uh, yes, and ultimately um, risking creating other fatigue failures in the rail as well. Um, yes, uh, roaming adocrat is mildly annoying how physics adjectives plastic and elastic have become permanently associated with specific kinds of plastic and elastic materials. <laughs> um, Jonathan Dixon is asking me whether I've ordered my uh, beer advent calendar. No, I haven't. How are we doing with time? In 19, we've got 10 minutes to get through some more. Right, here's a classic. 204, sidewear. Um, this is spectacular sidewear. I mean, wowza. That's like someone's taking a bite out of the rail. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, that's due to traffic loads. You wouldn't expect to see rail... Uh, actually, nowadays, with heavy haul, perhaps, maybe the few of the quarry runs that perhaps you could get this sort of deformation. 
but actually you'd be very uh, you, you you don't see that sort of player out on track anymore particularly we've got continuous measurement trains that are picking up any sort of um major sort of wear on on curves so this is generally it's traffic load related um and the there's all sorts of reasons why you get crazy wear like this um but not that many rails should be looking like that in the uk let's just put it that way um they should be picked up and replaced far sooner uh dampy is saying pretty typical in some places well i thankfully no, not in any of the sites that i've been out and seen generally i've not seen where like that however on heavy hole places like australia uh, particularly some of their ore, ore lines i bet on some of their curves they'll get squishy rail uh, syndrome like this um it just looks like someone's taking a bite out of it it's quite spectacular um people are saying chuffing hell uh there we go right uh here we go ah yes abnormal vertical wear 205 so this is pretty hilarious you can see there's there's almost like a mushroom shape here uh the plastic flow of steel away from the top of the rail this is the sort of thing you know you'd expect to see this with massive annual tonnage values or a uh, problem with the rail steel but generally this is i mean this is a traffic related uh issue um the issue with getting lots of vertical wear generally this isn't too bad one of the issues is that this extra metal bit can be a bit of a problem um that's not so good uh but the other the other problem which is i don't think i have a picture for is actually as you reduce the height of the the rail you you increase the risk of uh the flange hitting the top of any insulated rail joints or fish plated you know fish plated bolter joints um on the track so that's generally you know that's that's your extreme limits of of headwear um actually you know that you can take a huge amount of head head off the rail and it's still pretty has, has retains most of its strength you, know, you take a sizable section off the top of the rail and it still retains a lot of its strength uh they're quite impressive things these uh people are talking about cheap steel uh yeah yeah uh I, quite quite uh, it can be it can indeed be but um if your rail is too soft and you've got very very high loads that can be a, a consequence 206 crushing similar thing to be honest um it's manifested itself slightly differently um yeah this is this is you'll expect to see the 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 kind of the running the kind of the basically this mushrooming this this plastic flow or kind of just absolute smacking of the of the rail it's just a failure like that the rail is just turned into cheese it's turned into camembert under the trains uh, which is not good uh, generally traffic related but uh, again if you've not specified the right rail steel or if there's a poor quality you know uh, softer alloy that can be a consequence 206 crushing right 207 localized head loss so this one i haven't got a picture for unfortunately so send them in if you have any um but this uh, this is the sort of thing that can happen in wet tunnels actually where you have particularly aggressive sort of uh corrosion conditions and so you're losing a huge amount of, of material to corrosion rapidly and then obviously that gets knocked off every time a train goes past and you can end up with a very rapid acceleration of of, of loss of of the of the railhead um so that's a that's a particularly key one uh, it can lead to very high uh, kind of dynamic forces so you know, high strike forces wheels pass which um yeah increases the risk that you you just break the rail into actually um uh next is the ah 208 insufficient rail depth yeah so um this is a bit like what i talked about earlier where you've got this head the head at some point you do lose the strength of the rail um you know once you've really shaved a lot off the top of the head you do start losing the overall sort of bending strength of the steel um and you can have a failure and also as i say you can strike uh the the fish plate uh i did so as part of my thesis i did a lot of work on this and um from my the calculations i did suggested that you that by the time you hit like you will hit the fish plate first before your fa your rail fails under normal british traffic uh, kind of traffic loads dan might have a, a thought on that but um yeah uh so um generally this is you'd get this you, you, the drivers would be picking up a bang every time they went over a joint before they you, you'd get a failure like this but anyway it certainly is a failure mode 209 lipping so this is a picture i've nabbed um but you can sort of see we've already had some pictures showing lipping where you've got this um the kind of the plastic flow material off the end edge of the rail um uh, it's a particular problem in snc but in plain line it's not a hugely big deal another challenge you can see here is the material lipping at the end of the kind of the rail end uh, so this this actually this picture is wrong for this failure mode because it, it should really be a um 
this is in the middle of the rail, not the end. But you can see that the plastic flow is getting close to making a contact between the two rails, which is bad for signaling where you've got track circuits. Uh, 2.11. We've got five minutes. Are we going to do it? How late are we going to be? Ooh, who knows? I'm going to have a sip of tea. Otherwise, I'll lose my voice. Hmm. Ella, you've missed so much. 2.11. Progressive transverse cracking. Attach or bow. So this is the failure mode that I did lots and lots of work on for my master's thesis. These generally start out as a, a hydrogen bubble or a, as, a, as, as, a, as some sort of uh, silicon or silicate uh, sort of defect. And then they start out tiny and they, they the crack propagates. And it looks like this weird kind of sort of strange uh, sort of Tasmania shape. But actually, it's it's a crack that's forming more like this. It's a crack propagating, kind of that's kind of uh, start. It starts with a little defect, but it propagates over time, grows and grows, and eventually it occupies the full width of the head, of, of the head of the rail. And so, you've the only bit of rail that's doing the work um, in the head is this is the the bit here. This this bit that I'm about to color in orange on the thing. Uh, this bit, and as you can see, it's a vastly reduced cross section. Um, Basically, the rail just it's very likely to end up with a, a clean rail break as a result, which is very bad. Um, these get picked up by uh, uh, kind of ultrasonic testing uh, and occasionally visual inspection. If 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 you can, uh, you know, if the crack has, has manifested already, then you can pick up visual inspection. But generally, you'd expect this to get picked up by ultrasonic testing far quicker than that. Um, yeah, so you get this 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 smooth as defined by the Tasho Val is this is this shape here, and um, it's. Uh, yeah, you can see it's got a it's got this kind of smooth uh, surface inside. Uh, yes, uh, Ella, you're telling me off about not having a Wacom tablet because my drawing is dreadful. Yeah, but I, you know, the the longer I take to buy things, the the less money I spend. If, by the time I uh, hit the bucket, right, it's a good thing. Two eleven, right? Two twelve, horizontal cracking of the head. Uh, this is a manufacturing defect of some kind. And uh, you can see it just you just end up with a big old crack, horizontal crack in the head, not good. And um, you end up often with a little kind of a local dip in the rail head. That's often a way you can sort of see here. There's this this sort of this sort of dip shape uh, in you sort of I've exaggerated there, but you can sort of see this the dip actually it starts about here and then finishes about here. Bit of a dip in the rail head where this this kind of the the, the, the top of the rail is sort of squashing out basically. Uh, number two thirteen. Uh, we're here, we've got some VLS, but this time it's in the rail head. Uh, this is absolutely classic VLS. Um, it's got generally from a manufacturing defect that then manifests itself lengthways along the rail. Uh, and you'll, the way that you generally spot this, and by the time you can see it in the top of the rail head, it's, it's very likely to be too late and you need to put a speed on and or close the line. But often you'll see, a, this, this is quite far advanced, but often you'll see just uh, a little line that the rain collects in, and, it, and, and after the after a train's passed, the top of the railhead re generally dries pretty rapidly. But it leaves, you'll see a little damp patch that's left by this by this issue, um, a little it kind of from the crack where it's a very light, and it's also partly the rain stays because again you get a dip in the you generally get a squashing of the rail, maybe a widening of the of the head slightly as a result of this 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 kind of uh, piping uh, failure. Um, yes. Uh, Dan says it's due to crap steel. Uh, yep, that, that's that's understandable. <laughs> uh, right, 216, surface defects. I always found this picture a bit weird. It's like a slightly haunting image. Like, why? Ugh, yuck. Look at these. You don't want to see this sort of thing. These all look like manufacturing defects to me. Uh, so we've got, like, uh, what, some flaking. Uh, we've got kind of like a, a long groove thing going on here. Kind of a, a bit of a line. This is imaginatively called a line, this one here. There we are. A line. Yeah, nice. Um... Yeah, um, so no, these aren't good, and they generally end up with noisy rail, high dynamic loads that often result in a rail break from a you know high dynamic forces, or or you know hopefully it just gets swapped out. All this sort of stuff doesn't get onto the network um, anymore, but it clearly used to because these pictures. Ugh. Anyway, oh, we've got one minute. I think we haven't done it. I think we've failed. 217, local batter of the running surface. So you can just see there's a, a section of the rail surface here that's just getting whacked. Um, generally, again, it's a manufacturing defect. Uh, it's a very unusual defect, and it's not... Uh, certainly, in the, the current standard isn't entirely sure where it comes about. 
Um, but it's just this this sort of slightly strange. It just for whatever reason you just get a dip, a, a kind of a, a kind of a hammer effect dip on the top of the railhead. Um, it's not as catastrophic as other failures if there's not a crack involved, but it is still a bit of a weird one and can lead to you know additional dynamic forces and stuff. Two twenty one. Here we go. Right, we're into RCF. This is the this is the the big stuff. The stuff that is shall we say more contemporary. Um, two twenty one. RCF shelling of the gauge corner. So this is gauge corner shelling and cracking. You can see here that there's there there are little kind of cracks that. Well, let me get my black pointer up. So you get these sort of cracks here that are forming. They they they, they kind of look like this. In fact, I'll uh, just clear that and do and do a circle around them because uh, that don't want to do that. I want to do this. I don't need help on my pointer. I just need to erase all the ink on the slide. There's probably a key command for that. You can see them here. The, these pictures are pretty pixelated, so apologies for that. Um, they're out of the standard, and the standard is not very good resolution for, I don't know, PDF reasons. But um, you can see these cracks, and they kind of look they look a bit like me drawing with my mouse. They kind of have this... And generally, they have kind of quite a distinctive... They actually have quite a distinctive V or Y shape, um, uh, these cracks. And that generally depends on whether it's the high or low rail. Um, and... Oh, sorry, for everyone who's wondering what RCF is, RCF is rolling contact fatigue. So these are dynamic uh, failures. They're related to the, f the movement of wheels across the, across the, the track. Um, and they're particularly fatigue is due to repeated cycles. So rather than something that's just as a result of a heavy load, these are due to um, repeated cycles. So they, they wouldn't happen if a train passed once. They happen as a result of lots and lots and lots of tiny little motions and movements, a bit like bending a teaspoon back and forth until it snaps. Uh, anyway, there we go. So the shelling is where the, the, the bits of the rail come off in, in shells or chunks. Uh, and there you can see this, this is another one common on the low rail, actually. I see this a lot, uh, generally as a result of over-canting, of having too much cant on the track, is this um, this shelling of the running surface here. You just get this cracking and the bits of the, the running surface just break away. Um, strange. I've actually got, I should probably send my picture to, to Network Rail because I've got some cracking pictures of shelling and fa failure of that type. Um, South of Newcastle, just south of the King Edward Bridge, actually, there's probably still quite a lot of this because I bet it's still overcanted horribly. Anyway, uh, oh, can everyone still see me? I'm uh, I'm getting a bit of a uh, I'm getting a bit of a strange error from uh, YouTube. Can everyone hear me fine? Let me know if you can or cannot. Everyone still, everyone still there, still clear. I'm here. Good, 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 good. Yep, yeah, lovely. Um, Simon Zev Kendler points out uh, cracking pictures. Thank you, Simon. Lovely. Sorry for the break there in the feed. That was got a bit of a weird error message from uh, from YouTube, and I uh, don't want to lose the feed. That'd be no fun at all. We've already screwed up the 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 the, the competition to manage that in an hour. Where was I? So that's 221. 222 is uh, showing the running surface. It's RCF. Yep, we've done that. 223, gauge corner cracking. So this is the, the these you can really see. This is the, the absolute classic. This is the Hatfield failure. This is what, what gave us the Hatfield failure. You can see these, um, they look fairly innocuous. They look like very tiny hairline fractures on the on the corner of the, on the gauge corner. So when we talk about the gauge corner, we talk about, uh, so you've got your two rail heads here, uh, one on this side. And then you've got another one uh, on the other side like this. Uh, those should be flat surfaces actually on, on the gauge face, but uh, don't worry about that. Anyway, that will be 14, 36 millimeters. Uh, it's actually, it's, I know everyone's going to say, well, it's 14.35. Yeah, but we build concrete sleepers with, a, with 14.36 as the gauge. So actually, for the most part, you'll find that gauge is 14.36. And it actually varies pretty wildly uh, from that. So uh, 14.30, okay. 14.35 is the standard value. You know, that's your four foot eight and a half inches. Um, and this is the gauge This is the gauge corner here, this bit. Here, this bit. Here, these are the gauge corners. So they're the side. They're, so generally through a curve, um, the high... Oh, right. To define the high rail and low rail. Uh, so here's a sleeper on a curve. And you've got the rails here. Uh, this is the low rail. So the... The, the rail that's the low rail through the curve, the one that's at the bottom, uh, or the inside of the curve, sorry, uh, and this is the high rail. Uh, that's an important thing for me to define, apologies. Low rail, high rail. 
and even if you're tr uh, so this is where you're you're kind of on a on a curve on curve track um, but even if there's no cant you still refer to the inside rail as the low rail and the outside rail as the high rail does that all make sense is that all nice and clear lovely stuff um Currently crucifying traffic in New Zealand. Are they having lots of, G of uh, RCF uh, gauge corner cracking issues? Yeah. Well, we learned the hard way in Hatfield, didn't we? And we had to update lots of our processes and do many things to um, to, to resolve this issue. And it also caused us to um, obliterate traffic uh, on the railway for about a year. Uh, or certainly, uh, there was a couple of months of almost nothing moving, really, and everything going at slow speed. And then it was a year of recovery. It I think it took us about three or four years to recover back to back to where passenger levels would have been without without that incident or you know um had the trajectory been pretty straight from passenger growth uh something to learn some, for the stat statisticians go and have a look at those numbers to have a think about how long it'll take us to get back from covid uh but also note that we do recover anyway right 224 rcf head checking i couldn't find any head checking pictures which is annoying because i do have some i know i have some but uh there aren't any in the standard either um, but head checking is, um, it's a particular form of RCF. Um, it's lots of like little cracks. It's a very specific type of set of cracks um, across the railhead from kind of the, the running edge, um, kind of right across the head. It's, it's it, yeah. Uh, they, again, the, the crack patterns are very familiar, this sort of, the, these sorts of patterns. Um, again, field flow and field cracking. I don't really know what these are. Uh, it's a form of RCF. Um, it's related to the flow. It's related to plastic flow um, more than the other forms of RCF are uh, in the midsection of the rail on the head. But again, there's no picture, and I, I don't know a huge amount about this. Um, it's unlikely to be found on a straight track, but that's true of most of these forms of RCF, to be honest. Um, but the issue with the field side is, is the fact that so when we so uh, on my last picture so this this is the gauge face of the rail here so the inside face of the rail uh, where as defined by gauge is is the gauge face of the rail the outside face so the other bit uh, there and also there um, is the uh, is the field side so uh, field flow is stuff that's happening on the outside of the rail the, the away from the the, the flange of the of the the, the rail uh, the train wheel. Um, why, why am I getting lots of nasty messages from, from YouTube moaning about stream quality? Is it really that? Uh, uh, is my internet on the blink? Very strange. Apologies, everyone. If they are getting any weird buffering, let me know if you are. Uh, hopefully it's not a problem. Um, right, here's some tongue lipping. Uh, keep the sniggers down at the back of the classroom, please. Uh, rolling contact fatigue here. You can see, again, it's that classic pattern, this S shape. Um, of uh, rolling contact fatigue that that is if you, that's a very familiar pattern that that s shape that that sort of this shape like that um, and often then in, accompanied by a, a, an additional sort of branch there but that, that the s shape is is classic yeah i'm gonna try and draw it there we go some of these s shapes am i drawing some sort of weird cult symbol probably anyway that's uh, that's classic rcf shape and you can see kind of this weird tongue lipping that's going on very very bizarre um, and this is generally, um, yeah, it's because cracks are already present and it's pushing material outwards. Uh, not good, not good. You don't want that sort of thing. Uh, everyone seems happy. It's just, oh, really? Uh, apparently the quality is great in the US. I'm going to wave. Yeah, it's a bit dark probably. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, right. Let's continue on our adventures through Failing rails. Has anyone been counting? How many? How many have we got through so far? Um, no buffering, but much railing. Thank you, Graham. Uh, oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Graham is saying the quality is great. Uh, the shape looks a bit like a musical clef. Yeah, possibly. Uh, right, two two seven. Uh, the squat. The famous squat. So um, a squat is formed where you have a. Um, You've got a cracking, a kind of cracking that runs. So this is the top of the rail surface here, right? And you have a crack that's formed generally on the head of the rail. Uh, so the top, so you sort of see here, uh, you get a little crack here and it continues to propagate uh, either along or indeed outwards. And that's not so critical. It's when it goes down like this into the um, into the head of the rail that you're, you've got bad news. Um, and so these, yeah, so you get this propagation and it's the propagation, you get this sort of D 
dip shape, this sort of squat shape, this flat, funny, funny sort of flat shape, a dark patch. Uh, but the bad thing happens when it propagate, does the propagation downwards, and that's where you get your crack. And what's particularly challenging with these is the ultrasonics. So there's there's a picture of a of a cut through the rail here for the for the benefit of podcast viewers, and there's a branch going downwards. But dangerously, there's also a crack continuing under under the surface of the rail, which means that the ultrasonics, uh, when reflecting down, will reflect uh, off the um, they'll reflect off the top crack, and they won't show the deep crack running down into the railhead. So that is a that's a serious problem. Um, and uh, so it's you have to do a mixture of visual inspection, ultrasonic examination, and tie. So if you can spot this dark patch, um, it's, it helps understand. It gives, gives you a hint that the uh, that there's an issue with the um, basically that you've, you've got, there's a high risk of a of a deepening kind of progressive crack. Squats bad. Two to eight false flange damage. So I, I, I've put a little diagram on this one because I think. False flange is an important thing to talk about. False flange is basically where you've not had uh, grinding of the wheel of the train enough, and you end up with a kind of this this funny hollow, what's called a hollow tread and a hollow shape, and you end, and, and that means you essentially have a pinch, a, a kind of a, a kind of a pointy bit of the wheel running along the top of the um, of the rail, which incre- which results in a massively increased amount of stress. So that means you're increasing the uh, sorry, decreasing the size of your contact patch essentially to a tiny kind of uh, stiletto shoe, and that results in a huge amount of damage to the top of the rail. And generally, it happens in S and C actually, where you have some of these issues. But actually, it can happen uh, on you know, if you've got this false flange, it can can happen all over the place. It's it's bad. False flange is bad. Um, yes, generally you'll see it happening at um, at, uh, at switches and crossings, but um, it can happen elsewhere. Right, 2291, isolated wheel burns. They're a form of RCF. Look at these weird things. So wheel burns are where you have a, where the wheel spins faster than it's moving across the head of the rail. So you get a huge spike in temperature, which changes the crystalline structure in the rail head um, uh, and can form cracks and, and, and indeed can actually physically burn material away as well. But generally, it's a change in the crystalline structure of the rail head as a result of increased temperatures. Dan, you can correct me on that. Um, 2292. Uh, so the difference between these two, 2291 and 2292, is whether it's an isolated patch or whether it's a continual sort of, uh, you know, that wheel has been spinning uh, faster than the, the rate at which it's moved over the top of the rail by quite a lot and has left a long patch of, uh, of, of kind of damage to the, to the railhead. Um, and that, that defines what you have to do with it, to be honest. So the reason why these are split out is because this one is like, well, maybe it's not so bad. This one is like, okay, there's a decent amount of damage here. We probably need to sort something out. Um, two three two one horizontal cracking at the web head fillet radius, but at the rail end. Actually, no, this is, shouldn't say rail end. That should say mid. I've, I've stacked that. That should say uh, in the middle of the rail. Likewise, that one should. I've just uh, you know copy pasted. Anyway, you can see what's happened here. It's the same as the previous version of the issue, except it's in the middle of the rail, not at the end of the rail. So this looks pretty nasty. Oh dear, this one's like a bit of a concertina shape. Ugh. disastrous. Uh, and uh, this one is at the foot. Uh, again, in the midsection of the rail, so you can see it's split away here. And actually, this picture, the the whole top section of the rail is just split away entirely, uh, which is, uh, funnily enough, not a good thing. Uh, yeah, you don't want that to happen. Uh, these are generally, uh, you know, the, these, as we said last time, these are manufacturing defects. Right, so we've got some VLS again, 233. Um, yeah, I've talked about these already, so we'll, we'll continue on. It's generally a manufacturing, well, it's always a manufacturing defect. Uh, right, this is an interesting one because it, there, there, someone sent me a picture of uh, of this happening that's derailed a load of buds and some uh, uh, some Nightstar stock in Canada. Uh, and the rail section is just completely corroded away. The web is, is like the web on that, the rail. There's, there's a picture in the report. It's just nothing. It's absolutely incredible. It's just gone. Uh, and yeah, that happens. This happens in tunnels It happens very often, but it can happen at level crossings as well where you've got a lot of road salt. Um, uh, yeah, those are the sorts of places where this sort of thing normally happens. It, it can happen next to the sea as well, um, but generally, yeah, it, it, extremes of salt, uh, generally at level crossings or lots of wetness and dryness in tunnels. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, clearly not great to, to, to let rusty your, your whole rail away. Right, I'm going to have a quick look through the chat. What's happening? It's 2014. Uh, yes, this is not going well. Uh, as 16180339995 has pointed out, we need some Zenoko rail uh, on that one. Absolutely. Um, right. Let's see. What's the change that wheel burns were more common 
Uh, what's the chance that wheel burns were more common in Steam days? Uh, yeah, I don't know, actually. I, I, I don't know, uh, because... Uh, yeah, I'd have to. I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that. There are still plenty of wheel burns around um, these days, uh, but think with things like traction, you know, with them, um, you know, uh, wheel slip protection and all these things. Uh, probably wheel burns are, are less common these days. I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me if the feed drops out because YouTube is screaming at me, despite the fact that my internet seems to be completely fine. Um, can they record the sound? David Shepard asks, can they record the sound the wheels make on the track and they use the changes in the sound to identify changes in the rails? Uh, what you're describing is essentially what the ultrasound, the ultrasonic testing unit does, which is it fires a sound into the head of the, into the, into the rail and, uh, the, the reflections tell, basically record the depth of any issues within the railhead so for the most part the reflection will be off the other part you know off the bottom of the railhead reflect back up um, i could do this on here couldn't i so the the signal comes the signal comes in here and it's ref comes in and it, it's reflected reflected off uh, sort of there we go like that uh, reflected off uh, and then it's picked up and for the most part it'll be the same but if there's a little defect or something the signal will be reflected off uh the the, the signal take less time to return to the detector and so they can pick up there's the, that you get a little trace it's like a little oscilloscope trace that tells you that the um that there's a, an issue there's some defect or something in the railhead so so what you've described does happen but not with running trains it's a, there's a, a thing that fires an actual signal into the railhead um i think there's some pictures on twitter that i did of when i went out and did it um that hollow tread diagram is exaggerated for effect asks Romy uh, i think so but not necessarily as much as you might think uh, contact patch becomes a pinhead asked James P yeah pretty much David Shepard uh, yes I answered that one uh, where else are we what are there uh, let's see uh, I think I missed this question earlier you mentioned 1976 this is Muser Zero uh, as a date a few times after th which things changed what is the significance of this date so that's the date at which we stopped producing ingot uh, rails from steel ingots the thing about steel ingots is that at the end of the ingot, after it's been rolled and rolled and rolled, at the end of the ingot, you have a load of defects and 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 um, uh, flaws and and little inclusions within the steel. Whereas uh, continuous casting just entirely gets rid of that, so you don't get those problems. Now that's the most fundamental change from 1976. Uh, there we go, lovely. So right, uh, why why are you telling me these things, YouTube? Leave me alone. Uh, anything else I missed? Do another at if if I missed anything. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, switch down to seven twenty p. Oh, here we go. Some buffering is going on. Uh, oh, okay. Nothing too major just yet. Oh, apologies for the buffering. I'll do a refresh and see if that helps. Uh, there we go. How's that? Is the is the feed running okay? Uh, Question from somebody who doesn't do ultrasonic testing. Given sound is just a mechanical wave, how much deformation could the ultrasound instrument cause in the rail? Uh, none. It's fine. It's entirely within elastic limits, I believe. Um, so it's not a... Well, not I believe. It is. So it's it's fine. Um, I've just refreshed. Hopefully it's fine. I'm really sorry about the, the issues. I don't know what the problem is because our internet is massive and there should never be a, a problem. Uh, I'm in a new development. So we have gigabyte fiber. Apologies for that, everyone, uh, particularly the people on the pod who are not having any issues at all because it's all nicely and, and post-recorded and they're just like, shut up about the feed. I just want to hear about rail failures in, in you know, uh, Reggie Yates' voice. Right, anyway, two, so we've done 234 Corrosion Web. 235, cracking around holes other than fishbolt holes. So this is where some other mug, some muggins, has tried to attach things to the rail by drilling a hole in it, which is a dreadful idea. Um, so you can see these these haven't been called bolt hole expanded, and so you've got a, 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 one of these star cracks has appeared, or in this case, kind of just just on the the diagonal. Um, these are sort of sheer the sheer cracks around the hole actually that are then propagated by the by the movement, which is not good. Don't do that. Don't drill holes in your rail. And two thirty six. Uh, oh wait a minute. Two thirty six is a diagonal cracking away from any hole, so that's where there isn't a hole. 
but you're getting this cracking. 236, why, where, why might that be? Well, it's because there's a, some form of uh, manufacturing defect. You'll notice a pattern. Lots of these are manufacturing defects, and therefore lots of them just don't happen on our current railway. In fact, the ones that we really have to think about are all the RCF ones. The others are just generally pretty rare these days. Um, talking of holes, don't drill a hole in your rail, and absolutely do not flame cut a hole in the rail. This is 237 flame cut holes. This is just a defect in and of itself. So there's no, no manufacturing defect. This is just an absolute muggins has come in with a flame cutter and chopped a hole in the web of the rail. Um, this person should be uh, taken out in front of the family. No, that's not. I'm not going to do that, Jeremy. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, no, but the, whatever happens, this is just a bad idea. Don't cut holes in rails. Um, this is bad. Uh, correct. Um, when you drill holes in rails for, for fish bolt holes, it does happen. But when you do it, it needs to be, you need to use a cold bolt expansion uh, mandrel fitting afterwards. You have to make sure that you do that after you've drilled the holes. But don't do it unless you need to. Um, right, anyway, back to, back to 239. Right, Dan P, you have to tell us about this. What the heck is a lap? 239, a lap. Now, my understanding is that it's just a strange little uh, side effect of the rollers rolling the shape of the rail, and you get maybe a funny little bead that runs along a bit like a branding mark. Dan P, are you still with us? It's very late, so if you've given up, uh, that's okay. Uh, apologies uh, for dragging you through this for so long. Um, you might have said goodbye up top. Um, uh, oh, yeah, you talked about Martin's site up top, which to do with the heat in the, the wheel burn. Good stuff. Um uh, right, if Dan's not around, then that's fine. Um, that Basically, I think that's what it is. <laughs> um, flame cutting is what's done when uh, people... Uh, there's, there's no excuse ever to flame cut. Uh, why would the, Kentish Railways ask, why would they do that? That's a very good question. I do not know why. Um, uh, oh, yes. Oh, Dan is with us. Excellent. Uh, lap is a rolling defect. Material is folded back on itself. Uh, is, so it is a rolling. It's a defect from the rolling process. The process, lots of rollers, the, the way the rails fly through at a speed, right? And there are lots of rollers and that gives you and they go through several times and that gives you the perfect like micron accurate shape of the way of the rail. Again, I presume this is just from Dicky manufacturing. This is sort of thing that just wouldn't happen in modern rails. Um, it's a crease in the steel when rolling. That's very interesting. Uh, right, next, bruising. Right, bruising is um, generally from uh, things like derailments, uh, where you've got a piece of vehicle that's been dragging, damaged tires on wheels, um, handling operations, um, you know, smacking the rail with a hammer to move it, which is a very bad idea. Um, all sorts of yeah something that's embedded in the wheel the train wheel that's whacking the rail these sorts of things you know stuff falling from trains flying ballast uh, these are all the sorts of things that result in bruising these are things that do happen every now and then and often they're innocuous but if they're particularly big and damaging then it's worth swapping the rail out um uh right uh good right here we go uh, next, so that's 241, bruising. 242, railhead arcing damage. I don't have any pictures, but basically arcing uh, as a result of uh, an electrical short circuit. Generally, this is a third rail issue, and it's pretty much the means of detection is visual, because if you've had arcing damage, it's probably blown a hole in the top of the rail, and you need to cut it out and replace it. Um, I am so sorry about the buffering. I'm getting some complaints. It, I, I, do not, I have no idea what's going on. Um, Ella, is there a way to, like, can it... What if I OBS stop and start? Will it... Um, Will it break things? Uh, Ella, give me some advice on the stream. Uh, yes, right. I'm just going to do a quick check. Apologies for everyone in the chat. Why is it doing this? I'm going to very, very quickly do something. Uh, oh, I didn't I didn't even do the, t the We Are Live tweet. That's, uh, that's, that's a thing. Let me just... Uh, just do this. Apologies for everyone in the feed. I'm just doing a bit of error checking because, uh, you know, professional as ever. <laughs> uh, let's go big face while I'm doing that. Hello, big face. 300 megabytes a second. Ping 9 mm milliseconds. What is my upload? That's the, that's the key test. Mm. 500 megabytes a second. Oh, so it's not my internet. Uh, right. Why is it doing this? Uh, 
buffering as much as an unfitted freight car in a freight jam. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, yep, apologies. I don't, it's not like if I move around fast, is it going to make it worse? People are in 480p land. What? This isn't good. What's going on? Maybe it's YouTube. Maybe that's why. Why? Why? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to risk it in case YouTube has a has a fit. Uh, I don't want to create a new video. Uh, I'm really sorry about the the quality. I shall work out why. I don't know whether. Hopefully, it's not OBS updating because OBS updated. I've never had this problem before. It's all a bit weird. Anyway, right. I'm professional as ever, so I'm just going to smash onwards uh, as if everything's fine. Oh dear. Right. Arcing. Right. Railhead deformation. This is. Uh, so this refers to um, kind of basically the same as above but more substantial so bruising is little bits uh railhead deformation is like maybe where you've had a, a, a flange climb derailment or something um it's a good idea to swap your rail out if you've got visible deformation of the railhead uh right uh oh god i haven't got i haven't got discord open ella because i just in case it makes noises Right, 251, tamper damage. Oh, I don't have a picture of this. Again, send your photos to a network rail to include in the standards. But a tamper is this thing here. Um, a load of tines, digging at the track to uh, into the ballast around the sleepers. Uh, basically, what happens is the, the machine lifts up the track to the position it's supposed to be. The tamper tines vibrate at a high frequency and sh sugar all the ballast in underneath the sleepers. Um, and then basically result in the, the the ballast all vibrates down underneath the sleepers and holds the sleeper in the new designed place, including you know lifts and slews, removing the trap position. Sometimes though, uh, if every any of you have played the tamping game, uh, then you'll know that sometimes you can hit sleepers, which is bad, uh, and indeed you can hit the foot of the rail quite uh, if you're if you're a bad tamper driver, and that can result in damage, uh, and often you know it can result in a rail break in fact, which is bad. So quite often they will. Um, Oh my goodness, 240p land, Bjorn, that's rubbish. Uh, yes, I. it must be YouTube because everything's fine my end. YouTube, sort yourself out, this is disappointing. I should have recorded it separately, right? Um, uh, YouTube, it's an absolute state of you. Um, right. Is it because YouTube is dying? Is this what's happening? Ella, is it because of... Uh, is it the Americans? Is it Trump? Have we got Trump to blame for this? Uh, right, 252, rail foot arcing damage. Ah, here we go. There's some arcing that's burst a hole in the rail. That's not good at all. Um, I'm going to hammer through these. 253, longitudinal vertical cracking in the rail foot. So it's VLS, as we've discussed before, but it's in the rail foot. Often it manifests itself in a piece of the rail foot breaking away, which is bad because it means that your rail is not being held onto the sleeper by the fastenings anymore necessarily, which can result in gauge failures as much as anything else. Um, 254, rail foot corrosion. So again, this can happen in tunnels, at level crossings, just basically where you've got heavy corrosion. Um, eating away at the foot. This is, a, what a mess. This is, it's like a little triangle. It's just been eaten away completely. This has happened under a clip. You can see there's a little bite here. That's probably happened underneath a, a clip uh, where there's been corrosion. And even worse is when it's buried directly underneath the web and it can result in cracks that give you rail failure. In fact, this is still quite a common failure mode. Um, in le places like level crossings where you have this, uh, you know, some pressure point, uh, you know, maybe a bit of grit between the pad and the rail that's creating a stress concentration. Um, and uh, it's still moving. Good. Sorry, I've just seen a bit of a, a bit of a freeze. Uh, you're also, interestingly, everyone's miles behind me in the chat, which is quite interesting. Do not know why that's happening. I've just F5'd again. Uh, it's all very strange. I'm not very happy with YouTube having done that. Um, uh, yes, rail foot corrosion is bad. 255, gall. Uh, a similar thing. That's where you have, but it's where you've got um, rubbing of the uh, the bottom of the rail on the... Let's get a, get a... So basically, yeah, if you've got movement between the sleeper or, the, or perhaps you have a padless, uh, you know, you don't have a pad, you've just got concrete under the rail and you've got movement. It can actually rub uh, a shape uh, underneath. And even with the pad, you can get rubbing under the foot of the rail, which can actually quite substantially reduce the cross section of the foot, which is bad. Um, YouTube didn't pay their tax and now the council is cutting off their internet access. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, 
Uh, thanks, Romy Adcrap. Yep, uh, I believe YouTube are being uh, rubbish. It sounds like it's a YouTube issue rather than a, a me issue. So I'm really sorry, but blame Google. Alphabet, you're uh, you're off the case. You're 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 cancelled. Uh, so that's goal four eleven. Progressive transverse tracking. Tashovala a weld. Right. Okay. We're into the realms of welds, uh, which I'm not going to talk a huge amount about because I don't know a huge amount about welds. But these are the sorts of things which we spot. So again, it's one of these tashovals, except that this time it's an inclusion within the weld. So within the actual uh, kind of new steel that's been added as part of the weld. So that's bad. Four twenty three. RCF gauge corner cracking at or head checking at a weld. So again, it's this is stuff that's happening just as we've described, but in the material as part of the weld. Um, again, squat on a weld, that's 427. 429, a wheel burn on a weld. 432, horizontal cracking of web at a weld. This is quite a good one. So for whatever reason, there'd be maybe some introduced stresses at this at this weld, and it's resulted in the formation of a crack. So if I just whiz down to 432. Um, yes, so a, a small crack um, in the uh, can, can result in the complete breakup of the rail at the, at the weld, which is obviously, you know, bad. 435. This is a common one. Cracking through fish bolt holds at a weld. So um, this is where perhaps they've not properly cleanly cut, uh, so, so disc cut the ends of a... So it's quite common, and still is actually here and there, to um, get rid of the bolts, uh, get rid of the fish plates, and weld up formerly bolted joints. This was pretty common on... Um, uh, you know, it's pretty common on bullhead, but very common on jointed uh, flat bottom track sections where you, you kind of create longer lengths of, of rail uh, and kind of create kind of a hybrid welded, not welded jointed track thing. It's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, uh, frankly, uh, it's it's a bad idea. Don't do that. Just get rid of all the joints and put in proper long welded rails. It gives, uh, gives British Steel something else to do. Uh, but welding this, if you haven't disc cut the ends of the the, the rail um, for whatever reason, if you've you've cut out some of the holes or you've butted rails up, um, and you've got kind of a corroded end, so you want to disc cut because you want to have clean steel to, to to for the weld. If you don't do that, you just use the sort of the the um, the kind of the open end that was open to the elements in the do in the the, the, the bolted joint. Uh, that's lots of horrible inclusions, and there's a very good chance that you'll get a, a failure of that um, of that weld. So there we go. That's four thirty-five. Oh, we're, we're right. Okay, we're we're getting close. So there's a load of weld process and weld repair and attachment defects here that I'm not going to go through. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen. Lucky for some uh, that I'm not going to go through because I don't know a lot about welds. It's a gap in my knowledge because it's a main, a purely maintenance domain thing. It's not something that. Um, that I, I have ever needed as a professional to know about, so I'm not going to pretend I know lots about it. What you can do is buy the uh, buy the PWI book on welds, which is not behind me because I don't actually own it, um, but I'd hardly recommend it. <laughs> In fact, I remember chatting to Dan about the, that very book, which I presume, Dan, you've inputted into. In any case, um, oh, which means now, where are we? Ah, yes. So uh, those are the last... that. So then we go into five, six, seven, which cover um, switch derailment uh, hazards. So things like where you've got worn stock rails, switch blades, uh, defects associated with machined rails, and also things to do with cast crossings. But this episode is only about plain line rails. It's not about S and C. So I'm going to ignore all of these. We're looking at plain line only. So ignore these. So what you the moment you've all been waiting for at twenty thirty three on Wednesday the thirtieth of September. Uh, 2020, which is how many defects did we get through? Did we get through 100? <laughs> we did not. That was really loud for everyone, I hope. We got through 99, which we'll do in an hour and a half. And actually, to be fair, just about an hour, because we started at pretty much half past. So, 99 defects. I'm, 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 I'm at peace with that. 99 defects uh, at rocket speed, with a little bit of messy, stupid YouTube being broken. Um, it says excellent connection now, so it seems like YouTube is fixed. Is everyone getting 1080p now? Um, uh, strange. Oh my goodness, I'm exhausted. That was that was a rush, and also mildly stressful because of YouTube. YouTube, you're taking views off my life, man. Come on, I'm gonna bring my big face up. Hello, everyone. I'm really sorry about that. I hope that hasn't interrupted and spoiled people's um, enjoyment too much. Um, you know, I make this 1080p so that it looks nice, and it's annoying when YouTube then completely miserably fails. Oh. 
so 99 yeah we did 99 i'm pretty 99 i that was completely by luck i did not know i just counting it about two hours ago when i was putting the putting the slides together it came to 99 and i burst out laughing so uh yeah there we go i'm uh, i'm at peace with that oh yes everyone thank you uh <laughs> That's all I have to really say. Any questions? Uh, here we are. So, lots of questions. Not losing it, just getting gaps. The chat. We're behind you in the chat because the buffering. Yes. Massive angst. Every time you buffer, we don't lose any video. It just passes, pauses for us. So, we're now way ahead. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. Um, hopefully, people have had their ears blasted now. Oh, the, the YouTube's complaining again from my perspective. It's stupid. We've lost a lot of people, which I'm 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 sorry about that. We're down to we're down to sixty viewers. We've uh, the buffering is probably not the best. It's really upsetting. YouTube, you've disappointed us all. Anyway, let's get back to this. So, oh, podcast. This will be a bit weird for the podcast people because presumably it'll be fine for you lot. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, ninety nine. That's number wang. Yeah. Um, 99 defects, but welds aren't one. Well, no, we did kind of do welds. Uh, yeah, there we are. Lots of 99 problem jokes. Everyone in the chat, give yourself a gold star. Solid effort. Um, we're available on podcast formats. All podcast, you know, widely accepted on all podcast platforms. Coming soon to Audible as well, I think, possibly. Uh, once Amazon changed their rules about me not being allowed to slag off Amazon. Amazon, you need nationalizing. Um, so yes, listen to us if you thought this was horrible in uh, YouTube's buffering mess. Try listening to it in audio only with a buffering mess. Uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, oh, if you want to shout at me about this, go into the Discord, um, GarethDennis.co.uk slash Discord, and then shout at me, and that's fine. Uh, if you want to throw money at me, uh, or indeed you don't want to throw money at me, uh, then PayPal.me slash GarethDennis is the place to go. But if you do want to support me to do better, um, and you want to pat me on the back for persevering through YouTube's inflicted pain upon me, then um, please do support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis. A uh, bit weird to say my own name several times. It's a bit, a bit odd. Anyway, Patreon. Uh, you can choose future episodes, themes, and guests. Uh, particularly guests. Suggest Lots of people suggest guests they want to see, which is great, because the themes make, make themselves up, basically. You get sneak peeks and content, and I sh send things to you, and you can listen to me do chat while we talk through future videos and, and potential production choices um, and generally get asked inane questions by me um it's all good stuff really um oh yeah you're gonna want to know i'm gonna i've gone big face again hello but actually i'm gonna go off big face because next week is rail week rail week um so we're having a special like look it's not even got an orange background it's it's look at it it's not orange it is it is white with orange text uh, yeah, it's Rail Week next week, and so we have, for episode 30, good grief, 30, well, technically 31 of these, um, we're going to talk about the skills gap. Harriet Glenn's going to join us, and we're going to talk about, uh, it's going to be a, an Ask Us Anything, essentially. Um, uh, yes, it will be, uh, it will be, don't worry, I'm going to go back through and, and look at the questions, David, don't, don't, don't you worry. Um, we're going to talk about all sorts, but, but ideally... The sorts of questions we're hoping to get are from people who are interested in a career on the railway, um, people who are at early stage of their career or perhaps changing uh, changing career, who are interested in coming into the railway. That's This is the episode for you. Everyone else can come and join and generally um, prod me in the side of the head. But uh, really, we're looking for people, so anyone from sixth form, even younger if, if they like, but anything from sixth form up to kind of university, uh, apprentice level, people deciding to change career even, that's going to be the episode for you. So it's going to be based around lots of questions, hopefully. Lots and lots of questions. Um, yes. And that that's really that's really where we're at. So if I go big face, uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. That was a bit of a... I was enjoying that. Uh, but the, 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 the buffering stuff has really has spoiled it for me a bit. I was enjoying going through rails at high speed, but it's taken the edge. I, I can't do, you know... Anyway, sad face. Uh, if you want to tell me how dreadful my uh, how dreadfully unprofessional my YouTube videos are, then the, the the comments are where to do it. Give it a dislike. No, don't give it a dislike. That'll make me really sad. Oh. Um, right questions. David Shepherd is repeating in case I missed whether there is a league table of which defect numbers are most common. Absolutely, there are. In fact, uh, quite a lot of the details about. I don't know if it breaks down to the individual stuff, but certainly it's 
the wider data about rail defects is op is open data. It's accessible on the network rail or on the uh, ORR or transport gov. I think it's in the ORR data portal. You can get in and access that data. But yeah, certainly network rail have a recording of all the uh, all of those defect numbers, how frequently they appear, where they appear, the sort of all the data because that helps to second guess. Uh, you know. Uh, for predictive rather than pre uh, for predictive and preventative rather than reactive maintenance means you have an idea of why the problems are occurring. Um, Nikki wants to work for the railway. Nikki, the, 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 so that's that's great. So you need to join us in a week with hopefully not dreadful buffering video action. Um, uh, Robin Weston wants to know whether there'll be an episode on buffers. Better than that, we need to have an entire episode on Ipswich buffers. I think. Can we can we stretch an hour's content out of Ipswich buffers? I reckon we can. If there's anything that this hackneyed and laboured format can cope with, it's anything. Uh, so, right. Uh, <laughs> right. Oh, do you want to know how to fix them? That's for another episode. I've got, you know, how I've got to do 20,000 of these things until I retire. I don't know how many weeks there are in my life. Uh, so, you know, there's plenty of time for <laughs> how do we fix all of said defects. Oh, anyway, right. That's been an hour and 40 minutes. Good grief. Okay, right. Everyone, go to bed. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. You've been a wonderful audience, despite uh, failures of technology. All I can say is um, thank you so much. Cheerio. Cheerio.